Okay, so when we talk about the first naval battle of the Civil War, it all starts in the fall of 1861 when the Confederates discovered an abandoned Union Navy Yard in Norfolk, Virginia. So in the fall of 1861, the Confederates discover an abandoned Union Navy Yard in Norfolk, Virginia. What's a Navy Yard? Where, where ships are docked and stored, kind of like a parking lot for cars. But this one was abandoned and the ships there weren't in very good shape. They abandoned the ships too. It's on your ID sheet. Nor Fork, N O R F O L F O L K. No, Nor Folk, excuse me, Virginia. Now, there was an abandoned ship there that the Confederates kind of had their eye on, so they claimed that ship, which they eventually called the Merrimack, which is on your ID sheet. So the Confederates claimed one of those abandoned ships. They claimed one of these abandoned ships, eventually calling it the Merrimack. Now picture this, the ship had been burned all the way down to the water line. So what did you have only? Just the bottom of it. And that's why they picked it, because their plan was to rebuild it. Okay? So they picked this abandoned ship, which is burned all the way down pretty much to the water line. So, as Brady said, they rebuilt the ship, reconstructed it, and added a four-inch iron plate all the way around it. Added a four-inch iron plate on this ship. So the Confederates reconstructed the ship, reconstructed the hull, and they added a four-inch iron plating. It was all the way around. Militarily, what they put on the Merrimack were ten guns and a cast iron battering ram. So the Merrimack was equipped with ten guns and a cast iron battering ram. That's exactly right. Yeah. Now, it turned out that this Merrimack ended up being a better ship than any ship in the Union Navy. So what's the Union got to do? Catch up. They better build one as good or better. So at this point, the Union knew they must build a battleship equal or better than the Merrimack because the one that the Confederates reconstructed was better than anything they had. So the Secretary of the Navy, a guy by the name of Gideon Wells, talked to a Swedish-born inventor by the name of John Erickson, and he asked him to build a battleship better than the Merrimack. So when the Merrimack was completed, the Union knew they better build a ship equal or better than the Merrimack, and so Secretary of the Navy, Gideon Wells, turns to Swedish-born inventor John Ericsson and ask Ericsson to build a ship better than the Merrimack. So it will be John Ericsson's job, a Swedish inventor, to come up with a ship better than the Merrimack. Well, he also, Erickson designed an ironclad ship just like the Merrimack. But it only had two guns, not ten. But actually they were more effective because what did they do? Pivoted. Revolved. Very good. They pivoted and revolved around so they could shoot from a 360 degree angle without turning the ship. Didn't need as many. He said, that probably that's, those two were as good as 20. You know what I mean? So, Erickson designed an ironclad ship with only two guns, 
but these guns would be in a revolving gun housing and pivot all the way around 360 degrees. This ship was called the Monitor. This new Union ship was called the Monitor. So, what did we get to on uh, this Gaza box? Not yet. Did I, is he on there? Yeah. yeah. Oh, we can, you can cross him right off. We have a shortened version here. Now, comes the battle between the two ironclad ships. March 9, 1862. March 9, 1862, the Merrimack and the Monitor met outside of Hampton Roads, Virginia, which is on your ID sheet, in the first naval battle of the Civil War. On March 9th of 1862, the Monitor and the Merrimack met outside Hampton Roads, Virginia, in the first naval battle of the Civil War. What do you think the result was? Anybody want to guess the result before we get into it a little bit? Tie. Tie. Yeah, that's right. The two ships hammered at each other, hull to hull. They fought at such close range, they collided five times. So they fought hull to hull. Yep. Can you look at the after the Virginia part again? On March 9, 1862, the Monitor and Merrimack met outside Hampton Roads, Virginia, in the first naval battle of the Civil War. Hampton Roads. Yep. Now, the two ships simply hammered at each other, hull to hull. They fought at such a close range that the vessels collided five different times. And after four and a half hours of fighting, the Merrimack drew off and neither <coughs> ship claimed victory. So the two ships hammered at each other, hull to hull. They fought at such close range that the vessels collided five different times. And after four and a half hours of fighting, the Merrimack drew off with neither ship claiming victory. But it was the first battle, naval battle of the Civil War. But you're going to find out that most of the fighting was done on ground. Did it have a name for that or no? First naval battle of the Civil War. Yeah. What'd you say they did call it the Battle of the Ironclads? Whatever. Okay, now that's going to take us to our next subtopic, which is the Civil War in the Western Theater. <clears throat> in essence, what would be the, there's going to be two theaters in the Civil War the Western Theater and the Eastern Theater. What separates it? Mississippi River. Very good. Okay. So we're going to talk about the Civil War in the Western Theater. Now, after the first Battle of Bull Run, in which the Union suffered a disastrous defeat, unfortunately for the South, they didn't do what? Push forward to Washington, D.C. The Union had to reevaluate their strategy a little bit. So their strategy shifted to the Western Theater. And what the Union wanted to do was gain control of the Mississippi River. Because if they gain control of the Mississippi River, what would they do to the Confederacy? Split it in half. Very good. That was their goal. So after their loss at Bull Run, President Lincoln and his military advisors and generals got together and said, we better come up with a little different strategy because guess what? Our strategy of beating them and having them quit didn't work very good. Matter of fact, we got beat. So we got to come up with a little better strategy. I don't think this is going to end with the first victory over the South. So what we're going to do is we're going to try to gain control of the Mississippi River and split the Confederacy in half. The state, which of the states are going to be separated from the South if they succeed in that? What three states aren't going to be in the Confederacy? They're going to be split off. Texas. Texas. That's territory still. Louisiana. Texas, Arkansas, and Louisiana. Okay, it's okay. So the three states that are going to be separated from the South, if this is successful, will be Texas, Arkansas, and Louisiana. Which one's the most important of those? Louisiana, because what do they have there? Port of New Orleans. Okay. 
So, the Confederate states that will be separated. Now, what three states are you going to have to capture to make that happen if you look at the map? Geography's not our thing. What's this state here, Nayeli? Mississippi, how about that one? Tennessee, and how about that one? Kentucky. So the three Confederate states that are going to have to be taken to make this work, actually they're not all three Confederate because one's not a Confederate state. What three states are going to have to be captured or controlled by the Union? Kentucky. Is Kentucky in the Confederacy? Remember that was Henry Clay's state. State border neutral or northern. Okay. But Tennessee and Mississippi. Now, as I mentioned, the famous politician Henry Clay was a Kentucky Northerner, and he had strong influence with the state, so they control Kentucky with no difficulty. So the two states that they really need to get are Tennessee and Mississippi, because Kentucky's not going to be a problem, because Northerner Henry Clay controls the state. <laughs> Now, Tennessee is the first one we're going to talk about, and that's going to be very difficult to capture because they have a very strong southern tradition, and in order, to get te in order to control Tennessee, you're going to have to get the whole state, not just the western part, close to the river. They're going to have to get the whole thing. So that's going to be a bit of a difficulty. So Kentucky is going to be controlled by the Union without much difficulty. Tennessee, however, will be a different story it had a very strong southern influence, very strong southern state, and they're going to have to capture the Union, they have to capture the entire state, not just that western part, to make it happen. There were two forts that needed to be captured in order for us, or the United States, or the Union, to begin their successful control of Tennessee. First one was Fort Henry on the Tennessee River. The second one was Fort Donaldson on the Cumberland River. All of these on your ID sheet. So on February 6th of 1862, General Ulysses S. Grant captures Fort Henry on the Tennessee River. So the two forts that have to be captured are Fort Henry on the Tennessee River and Fort Donaldson on the Cumberland River. Where was Fort Henry? On February 6, 1862, General Ulysses S. Grant, kind of a familiar name, you've probably heard of him, have you not? And his forces captured Fort Henry on the Tennessee River. So, goal one accomplished. February 6, 1862, Union General Ulysses S. Grant captures Fort Henry on the Tennessee River. Fort Henry. Ten days later, on February 16th, Grant and his forces capture Fort Donaldson on the Cumberland River. February 16th, 10 days after capturing Fort Henry on the Tennessee River, General Grant and his forces capture Fort Donaldson on the Cumberland River. The reason why these forts were so important is because they controlled the rivers in which they were on, which meant that the capture of Fort Henry and Fort Donaldson is going to open the way for an invasion of the Deep South. They're going to go down to the Deep South and try to get what state? Mississippi. Mississippi. So in order to do that, they had to take Fort Donaldson and control the Tennessee River, Fort Henry, excuse me, Fort Henry and the Tennessee River, and Fort Donaldson on the Cumberland River. And once they won victories in those two areas, they would invade the Deep South by the way of those two rivers and try to get into Mississippi. So after his victory at Fort Henry and after his victory at Fort Donaldson, General Grant moved his troops southward 
to an area known as Pittsburgh Landing. Pittsburgh Landing. So they're going to be moving south to Pittsburgh Landing. That was a riverboat settlement located on the Tennessee River. So again, with Fort Henry and Fort Donelson captured by the Union, General Grant will march his troops southward to a place called Pittsburgh Landing, which was a riverboat settlement on the Tennessee River. It's right on the Mississippi-Tennessee border. Okay? Which will take us to our next subtopic, which is the Battle of Bloody Shiloh. Battle of Bloody Shiloh. Where are Union forces? Where are they located? Where are they located? Pittsburgh Landing, Tennessee. Well, on April 6th of 1862, Union soldiers rested at Shiloh Chapel. They had marched southward with Grant to Pittsburgh Landing, and they rested at Shiloh Chapel. What is Shiloh Chapel? Church. It's a church. Yep. So, on April 6th of 1862, those Union soldiers that marched southward with Grant and arrived at Pittsburgh Landing, Tennessee, were resting at Shiloh Chapel. Just 24 miles away were Confederate General Albert Johnston and his troops. So Union troops and Confederate troops are just 24 miles apart as Union General Grant and his soldiers are resting at Shiloh Chapel at Pittsburgh Landing, Tennessee, and Confederate General Albert Johnston and his troops were resting 24 miles from Pittsburgh Landing and Shiloh Chapel. But you know what's going to happen, don't you? They're going to engage. Now, this is interesting because Union General Grant doesn't know they're coming. And on that date of April 6, 1862, Confederate General Johnston stages a surprise attack against the Union forces. And Union forces and Southern forces fought for six hours with the South winning the first day. So, again, on April 6, 1862, Confederate General Johnston stages a surprise attack upon the Union forces, and the Confederates and the Union fight furiously for six hours that day with the South winning the day. What does the Union have more of than the Confederates? Troops. Troops. Very good. Ja uh, Grant receives reinforcements between the first day and the second day. And after receiving those reinforcements, Grant and the Union fought back the rebels and eventually occupied Corinth, which is a town in northern Mississippi. So on the second day of battle at Shiloh Chapel, the Union gets reinforcements, they fight back the rebels, and at the end of the day, the end of the battle of Shiloh, the Union had advanced all the way to Corinth, which was in northern Mississippi. Anybody remember how many casualties there were at the Battle of uh, Bull Run? No, oh, Battle of Bull Run. 3,000-ish, maybe 3,500 total, right? 1,900 to 1,700, I think, around that area, if I remember correctly. 2950. What do you got there? What do you got, girl? 2950 and 30 units and 17. Oh, 2950 and 17. Now you're better. So that's about three. 
about 4,500. In this battle of Shiloh, the reason they call it the battle of bloody Shiloh, more than 24,000 men on both sides were either killed or wounded. 24,000 in this battle. Compared to how many of Bull Run there, Donovan? Approximately, anyway? You weren't listening to Patty, who came up with the exact numbers? Ah! Because what, what have you been doing all the period here? Get oh, your head he's saying like the You got music on those phones going? Put that, give that to Mrs. Montoya. We'll Thank decide you. whether we're going to give it back to you ever. I really want a set of these. I did too. That's <laughs> half a set. Yeah. If he can bring the other half tomorrow, we'll just share them. Okay. He's saying the that difference was like around 20,000. Maybe well, I like the music too. To but anyway, so how many were killed in Bull Run there, Donovan? I've got no idea. Okay, how about it again, Matty? Give him, give him some info. 29. About 2,900 Union. Union and about. 1750. Okay, so 4,600 people killed. In this battle, 24,000 killed. That's why it was called Bloody Shiloh. Now, if you, if you split it up between north and south, about 13,000 Union soldiers were killed and about 11,000 Confederates, which seems like, oh, gee, the Union lost more. They did, but the problem continues. They have three times as many. Okay? So about 13,000 Union soldiers were killed at Shiloh, about 11,000 Confederate soldiers. So for Donovan's benefit, if we have an open note test and I ask what were the casualties on both sides in the Battle of Shiloh and you're not paying attention, you will get it wrong. But if you pay attention and write it down, you'll go, there it is. Okay? Now, among the 11,000...